Uh, good afternoon to all and welcome to uh, Maxima seminar. We're at seminar 16 of year two. We are with the Ambigua still, volume two. Today we're looking at pages 187 through 223. 187 through 223. So it's a, health, a healthy chunk. Uh, and it's comprised of Ambigua um, 43 through 48 so 43 44 45 46 47 and 48 so a handful a handful but gathering is one of the one of the themes here today uh speaking of themes drawing near drawing near becomes prominent for us as a theme and drawing near in aesthetic delight in aesthetic delight There's also the idea of an ecstatic mode of being, our ecstatic mode of being. That's another theme. And this informs our longing for wholeness, what Maximus calls our, our longing for wholeness. So that's the kind of uh, topographical uh, ground that we will we'll, uh, walk, walk through. In uh, just by way of, of introducing the, the the or walking into the themes, in the last reading we had, uh, this is on page one thirty one. Uh, we don't have to turn there, but but there's a clue to to what we we learn today. On page one thirty one, at the 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 bottom of that uh, first full paragraph, we learn that Christ's hiddenness is matched by his manifestation. So Christ's hiddenness is matched by his manifestation. He accepted to be hidden exactly to the same degree that he <clears throat> uh, was manifested. This is a clue to the clarity of form. Form is double in essence, double in essence. And just on just on our own terms and within our own horizon, we see how hiddenness and manifestation uh, complete each other, complete each other. Hiddenness is completed by the idea of manifestation, and manifestation is completed by the idea of hiddenness. So in our world, or rather our world completes its own form, completes its own, doubleness and all the form we know all form we know includes its own deformation as it were all form includes its own deformation now christ redeems our completion he redeems our completion from its finite conditions he redeems our completion from this world and offers us his own twofold completion maximus says twofold completion so christ redeems our completion from its finite condition by as maximus says conjoining our breath with the breath of the holy spirit by making our breath the vital inbreathing of the holy spirit and through this image maximus renders are our twofoldedness or our doubleness ecstatic ecstatic in the sense that we become complete beyond ourselves complete beyond ourselves in the holy presence of others in the holy presence of others so this is the ecstatic mode of being that we that we talked about last time the ecstatic mode of being just approach from the from, from the from the perspective of the aspect of the completion of form the ecstatic mode of being which means temporal and eternal synergy the synergy of temporal and eternal modes in us in our mode of, in our in our being this is realized by what we called last time the ecstatic presence of the eternal the ecstatic 
presence of the eternal, that moment of ecstatic presence of the eternal, when the eternal stands forth and through. And the presence, the ecstatic presence of the, of the eternal is felt in the logos. We feel it in the logos, the logos as person or the logos as word. The ecstatic presence of the eternal means that the present moment is always being transformed, always being transfigured. And it's to that transfiguration or that transformation that we seek to be attentive. And so when last time we were talking about watchfulness, watchfulness as attunement, and we wondered, do we know what we're looking for? Can we anticipate? And we were wary of that. This is not watchfulness for something, but this is watchfulness for someone as it, for that ecstatic presence of the eternal, which makes our personhood whole. So it's watchfulness as attunement, attunement to that, that transformation, that, that transfiguration. This watchfulness, this attunement, is also a form of co-response, as we said, or as we know, co-response. Our being is in co-response. And so watchfulness or attunement is by no means unidirectional. It's not guarding a fortress. It is keen participation in the energy of another person. Keen participation. That's how we co-respond with another. Keen participation in the energy of another person. This, part this participation is both presence and also presence for the sake of. Last time, we also discussed or talked about definition and, and, and certainty. And the question was raised, how do we unclench our spirit? How do we come to peace? Is it through definition, through ideas, through certainty, or through time? Or is it through through presence, through through love and loving company? Or to use words that came up last time and that we've used before, does our spirit ease itself in confidence, in sure-footedness, in faithful living with others, or through ideas, right? Are we responding to the idea in another person or responding to their spirit? Well, we remember too that there are no, no ideas per se, right? We, we, we wandered around this idea of definition. Definition is always ring fencing something. There are no ideas per se. There's only integration within a phrase, integration within a phrase. In other words, the movement of being, the movement of being. And a phrase, a phrase as a movement of being is evenly significant. It is evenly significant. In other words, a phrase proceeds from a whole breath, from a whole breath. <clears throat> Phrases grant us intervals by relating things together. The intervals, it, it signifies the distance or the intervals between. And harmony depends on interval. So we see the harmony of the phrasing of another person's being when we are attuned to them in love rather than through ideas. This is still the encounter we're talking about. Now, 
if a phrase is not evenly significant, if it has only one spotlight, especially temporal, it deforms the integrity of our perception, and we begin to mistake our completion of things. We begin to mistake our completion of things through misemphasis or through thinking that an idea is the point of a person or a phrase. And Maximus has warned us, uh, he's warned us before not to let especially time define what we think of another person, a moment in time, as if that person is definable. And it's in this one of his most remarkable passages, which I'd like to read out. If you have it, I'll read it out, but if you have it, it's volume one, page 217. And it's where we understand that the saints are called gods because time is no longer the determining condition of truth there. So Maximus says, this is 217, just about right in the middle of the page after a, a, a dash. These, these holy ones, He's been speaking of Melchizedek. These holy ones, I say, we should not characterize by the property of the things they have abandoned. Not characterize by the property of the things they have abandoned, even apophatically. But rather to name, name them from the magnificence of what they have assumed, for which and in which alone, henceforth, they exist and are known. Rather, we name them from the, from the magnificence of what they have assumed, what has been given, for which and in which alone, henceforth, they exist and are known. All right. What's he saying there? This is the divine, the, the, the divine calling unto us, divine naming, transcends categories of time. Right. We've talked about naming in, part, uh, in the past as a calling forth or a calling unto. So we understand God's calling unto, God's calling forth, transcends categories of time. This is the main thing we mean by drawing near. God's calling unto is his part of our drawing near. God's calling unto us becomes our for the sake of, our being unto. Our response to God's call forms our being unto, provides it, <clears throat> rather, provides it with, or provides us with our ethos, with our personhood. And it's that calling unto our being from beyond time that then establishes the trajectory of our lives. Okay. Um, so that's just by way of, of of introductory remarks. Let's page through. P please have your have your have your book uh, ready. Let's page through, and um, and just talk through a couple of things. So ambiguum forty three. Uh, it's on page one eighty seven now. J just page through. We'll page through together. Ambiguum 43, which is from St. Gregory's second oration on baptism. <clears throat> this is, uh, the passage from Gregory is, is, why do you seek medications when these are of no avail? Why do you look for the critical sweat when perhaps your departure is imminent? Here, he, he seems to be addressing those who have been postponing baptism to indulge in time, indulge in time. So not transform time, but to indulge in time, to use it to our advantage, to use it against God, as it were, which is a harrowing thought uh, for, for most of us, <laughs> uh, for me anyways. And also this idea here that we're just, we're indulging in time. We're putting off responsibility. We're not co-responding because we don't want to yet. There's the idea that if we brazenly assume that divine life is forever available to us, 
we are doing the opposite of drawing near. We are we are we are we are brazenly assuming we are we are providing a veneer of certainty of our own that forecloses all synergy. So that's ambiguum 43. Ambiguum 44, it's just over to page 191. It's just one page. It's also on baptism. The passage from St. Gregory is. Christ does not like to be stolen from often, even though he is a great lover of mankind. We have that wonderful phrase, lover of mankind. But it, it sounds very strange. Christ does not like to be stolen from often. We understand, first of all, that one of the themes is inappropriate grasping. Maximus has talked about, about sin or missing the mark being mistaking, misgrasping things, not erring. And we misgrasp even more clearly when, when we're certain, when we're feeling certain, and certain that God is right there for our taking. Also, towards the bottom of page 191, he, he talks about those who steal from God begin to be confused, and they need to think of good in terms of evil. And think of evil in terms of good, i.e. find ethical completion within terms of this world, within finite terms. It's, it's, the, it's the danger of, of mistaking the, the, the sense of, of apophatic or ecstatic completion and knowing it has to be beyond us. When we forget it has to be beyond us we confine ourselves to our own our own death. And then ambiguum 45, which is just over the page, 193. It's a little bit longer. It's a, it's a great one. It's from St. Gregory's Oration on Pascha. And we read, this is Gregory's, Gregory's words, Adam was naked in his simplicity and in a life devoid of artifice and without any kind of covering or barrier, for such was fitting for the primal man. The word fitting there, I think, is important. Devoid um, and simplicity. But what do we have here? This, this ambiguum circles around the idea of simplicity. It also begins to circle around the idea of artifice or making human creativity, which is not something that we have really stepped into yet, but we, we, we shall. <clears throat> Just turning over the page, on page 195, he talks about the temperament of, of our forefather, the temperament of the human body being a simple temperament. Not torn, not torn apart by mutually opposed and corrupting qualities so temperament becomes important there as a, as a path to simplicity and also a little further on habit the term habit becomes important habit as a path to eternity so we have temperament as a path to simplicity and habit as a path to eternity in this uh, in this ambiguum Excuse me. Ambiguum 46, which begins on page 201. This is also on from, from St. Gregory's uh, same oration on Pascha. And the passages, Gregory's passages, a yearling like the son of righteousness, or rushing forth from there, or circumscribed in the one whom we see. A yearling, like the son of righteousness, or rushing forth from there, or circumscribed in the one whom we see. Immediately, we, we understand that, uh, that part of this ambiguum is about um, appellation and, and naming. Um, Maximus clarifies that what's well, an older philosophical term, but the appellatives the common qualities that we can call our Savior's own, 
is different than naming the particular qualities that we can call one's own. Maximus talks about different modes of presence, different modes of presence that fit. And also here, he, he gives us an image of time compassed, time compassed. So this, this ambiguum is about the, the compassment of time as well. That's ambiguum 46. We're going to circle back to, uh, to these. Ambiguum 47, which begins on page 207 and goes to 211, is also on Pascha. And here the passage is, we need not be surprised that, first and foremost, a lamb is required in each and every house. In this Ambiguum, Maximus talks about the magnificence of creation, mystically proclaiming, mystically proclaiming the truth, the truth of Christ, mystical proclamation. And also in this ambiguum, he walks through imagery of the flesh of Christ and the soul of Christ and the mind of Christ and the divinity of Christ. He walks us apophatically through these aspects these aspects of the divine. And later we read, all aspects of God are for our sake. But that's another thought. So Ambiguum 47, about how we proceed with Christ through his flesh, soul, mind, and divinity. Ambiguum 48 which begins on page uh, 213. And uh, it's our last one. Yeah, it's our last one for today. This is from St. Gregory's same oration on Pascha. And the text from Gregory is, whatever is a fleshly and nourishing and nourishing part of the word, together with the intestines and hidden recesses of the intellect, will be eaten and given up to spiritual digestion. Now, <clears throat> as we can partly see by the composition of Gregory's passage, we're talking about wholeness, or Maximus rather is talking about wholeness in this passage. And also, integration of God's rich blessing. Integration of God's rich blessing. He also uses the language of transposition at a certain point, and he says, <clears throat> the spirit transposes us, as it were, into a proper key, into a proper attuned mode, as it were. But I like that word, transpose. It's one of my favorite words, so... <laughs> We can bring it to the forefront a little bit. So this, this ambiguum 48 is really about attunements. Longing and attunement. Okay. Uh, let's, let's read and think a little bit. Uh, so I'll read a couple of passage, uh, passages. Offer a few thoughts and and we can we can re return to these we can resume as we will the first is on page 199 to 201 please if you turn with me <clears throat> it is the passage immediately following the section another contemplation of the same difficulty this is on page 199 another contemplation of the same difficulty and what are we contemplating? This is the passage from Gregory again. Adam was naked in his simplicity and a life and in a life devoid of artifice and without any kind of covering or barrier, for such was fitting for the primal man. Page 199, halfway through. 
another contemplation of the same difficulty. Or perhaps he was naked, as the teacher says, of the multiform contemplation and knowledge of nature, of the multiform, and that's the most important word there, of the multiform contemplation and knowledge of nature, and his life was devoid of artifice, subsisting outside the various pursuits concerning the practical life and the acquisition of virtue, since he possessed by integral habits the untainted principles of the virtue of the virtues and he was without any kind of covering or veil since he originally had no need to rely on ideas discursively drawn from sensible objects in order to understand divine realities but had solely the simple putting forth of the unitary simple all embracing virtue and knowledge of things after God, which needs only to actualize its own movements in order to be voluntarily manifested. Let's read that again. Since he possessed by integral habits the untainted principles of the virtues, and he was without any kind of covering or veil, since he originally had no need to rely on, no need to rely on, rely on ideas discursively drawn, ideas discursively drawn from sensible objects in order to understand divine realities. That's us. That's what we have. Here's what we what we what we are amazed at. But had solely the simple putting forth, the simple putting forth of the unitary, simple, all embracing virtue and knowledge of things after God, which needs only to actualize its own movements, uh, the, the, the energy of kinesis, in order to be voluntarily manifest, voluntarily manifested. All right. Thus it cannot be doubted that those who, by means of a philosophical principle, wish to raise themselves up from the forefathers' fall, begin by completely negating the passions, after which they cease busying themselves with the principles of technical skills, and finally, peering beyond natural contemplation, they catch a glimpse of immaterial knowledge, which has absolutely no form susceptible to sense perception or any meaning that, be con that can be contained by spoken words. He's talking about form and meaning apophatically here. He's saying, if it's there, we can't. It's beyond. Then, just as God in the beginning, <laughs> just as God in the beginning created the first man, they too will be naked in the simplicity of their knowledge, in their life free of distractions, and in their mortification of the law of the flesh. All right. We, just a few thoughts here. We have seen already that temperament can lead to simplicity. Or, in other words, it's in our temperament that multiplicity is surpassed not mind, not ideas. And we also see here that habit is, as it were, the kind of cloak of eternity. Habit is time surpassed. Adam was possessed by integra have untainted principles in the virtues. So simplicity is multiplicity surpassed, apophatically. Eternity is time surpassed, and images of simplicity and eternity are in habit. We also have here the image of existence as simple presence, existence as simple presence, or we could say presence as communion. Presence as communion. And this is a presence which, or rather in which, the question of for the sake of 
is already integrated. It's not presence for the sake of. The for the sake of is integrated into the presence itself. So it doesn't, it doesn't occur as a discursive idea. It's of the integral temperament and habit. But that's what we see in Adam. We are, we are given, our task then that we understand is to work out that for the sake of. For the sake of. So Maximus introduces, in a way here, the idea of artifice. Artifice. Or we could say making. Or creativity. And we begin to get a sense of Maximus's idea or image of what it means, what, what, what human labor in service to divine communion means. Or rather, he shows us that our salvation is wrapped up in the striving, the seeking for our own completion in divine communion. He begins to shed light on human activity. Ah, so that's a passage and a couple ideas we can return to. Let's follow up, though. Uh, the next the next passage is uh, on page 203, just over to 205. 203 to 205. And uh, this is an ambiguum 46. Ambiguum 46, which addresses the phrase or Gregory's section, a yearling like the son of righteousness or rushing forth from there or circumscribed in the one whom we see. So this is an extract of Maximus addressing this. Page 203, second half, actually the, uh, the, 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 um, the paragraph that begins in the lower third of the page. And it's just over the page. If in such a manner, then, the year unfolds for us according to the movement of the sun, it follows that the year acceptable to the Lord, as scripture calls it, when understood allegorically, is the entire extension of the ages, beginning from the moment when God was pleased to give substance to beings and existence to what did not exist, was pleased to give, pleased to give substance to being and existence to what did not exist. And through his providence, like an intelligible son whose power holds the universe together in stability and graciously consents to emit its rays. That's no Platonic image. Through his providence, he deigned to vary the modes of his presence vary the modes of his presence so that the good things he planted in beings might ripen to full maturity unto, sorry, until all the ages will have reached their appointed limit. At that point, he will gather together the fruits of his own sowing, unmixed with tares and having not so much as even a trace of dust from any chaff. And the whole reason for the movement of things in motion will reach its completion. That's amazing. At that point, he will gather together the fruits of his own sowing and the whole reason, the logos for the meaning, uh, sorry, the whole, the, the, the logos for the movement of things in motion will reach its completion. And the worthy will receive the promised ultimate beatitude of theosis. And being gathered to God, by suitability according to likeness, every motion in them with respect to everything will attain its immediate limit and rest in the permanence that is in God itself. Every motion in them with respect to everything will attain its immediate limit and rest in the permanence that is in God himself. All right, so thinking just a little bit about this. 
First of all, we see creation phrased as giving. God was pleased to give substance, give existence. Creation, we remember, is a gift. And the act of giving, or, or the meaning of giving, is as profound as any, any we have. So creating is, is a little bit like giving here. Creating also uh, can be understood as making, as making. So creating and given, giving, giving and making. But if you create something free, you're also letting it be in synergy. So here we have creation as, a, as giving, creation as making, a giving as a letting, a letting be. This is a lovely way to to confuse our temporal prejudice that 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 giving is one way, you know, a one off thing, the same as we stumbled up with uh, watchfulness. The second thing we, we 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 can see right away is that God's gift is immediate, simple, w without mediation. God's gift is immediate, and God gathers His gifts unto His own simple immediate being so his gift is immediate and his gathering is immediate or in immediacy immediate here means formed formed right so immediate means beyond form it, it's a way of, of apophatically expressing how we understand form we've seen that Simplicity is form compassed. Simplicity is form compassed. And eternity is time compassed. Eternity is time compassed. And so what we read here is that form and time are no longer determining criteria beyond our mortal lives. Simplicity is form compassed, eternity is time compassed. And here's this, this is a thought, I, I don't think I phrase it clearly, but I think it's the main one. How we respond to God's call out of simplicity and eternity, so God calls out of simplicity and, and eternity. How we respond to God's call out of simplicity and, and eternity. And how we, in turn, call out to God out of our own being, which is our being is given form and time, is our synergy, is our path of striving. So how we respond to God's call out of simplicity and, inter and eternity and how we in turn call out to God, draw near, out of our own being, which is given form and time, is our synergy. This is why apophasis, not negation or denial of creation, is, um, is, is, is the truth of our tradition. Now, this calling, <clears throat> just to just to just to play with it a little bit more. At the beginning of this passage, we we see if in such a manner then the year unfolds for us according to the movement of the sun, it follows that the year acceptable to the Lord, as scripture calls it, when understood allegorically, is the entire extension of the ages. So scripture calls forth a truth in time. Scripture calls forth the truth here about harvest in time. Allegory, just saying something a little differently, calls forth something else, some other tr truth into time. How we call unto the eternal is part of our synergy. 
And here we read too, Maximus says, God deigns to vary the modes of his presence. He deigns to vary the modes of his presence. God's modes of presence are his, are his callings to us. And his mode of presence, his calling, calls us to our very own completion. Our very own completion beyond movement. So, we proceed apophatically through form as time unto simple, the simple eternity out of which God calls us. So there's some thoughts on 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 that little passage there. Now let's uh let's consider another. This is page 213, please. 213. Um This is, this is addressing St. Gregory's oration on Pascha. And it is about wholeness. Wholeness. And I was wondering if you wouldn't mind reading a little bit, if I could uh, prevail upon you to, to, to read. Um, you, you have to unmute. St. Gregory, the passage from Gregory is, whatever is a fleshly and nourishing part of the word, together with the intestines, and hidden recesses of the intellect will be eaten and given up to spiritual digest digestion. And Anna, if you wouldn't mind reading the beginning of, of the ambiguum, right over to page 217 uh, in the middle of the page, f f finishing with the words, that is the most fitting to his proper order. So the beginning of the ambiguum to most fitting to his proper order on 217, please. Okay. Having wisely given every nature subsistence and having concealed the knowledge of himself in each of the rational substances as first of their potentials, God gave to us lowly human beings as a generous master, a natural longing and desire for him. Combining this naturally with the power of reason so that we might easily be able to know the ways by which this longing might be satisfied and not fail to attain what we are striving for due to some mistake on our part. Being moved, therefore, by this longing for the truth itself and for the wisdom that is manifested in the orderly governance of all things, we are urged on to our goal, striving all the more because of these things to attain that for the sake of which we have received this longing. Having secretly come to learn this, those who are studious and zealous lovers of truth set before themselves one sole task and activity, namely arduous labor in the service of this desire. For from the actual observation and orderly sequence of things itself, they have correctly realized that if in this present age they should, through sacred visions, sketch out to a certain extent the image of the truth of the age to come and satisfy their longing for it, they would thereby prepare their souls and make them more eager still, so that after this life they would pass over effortlessly to the truth of the life to come, since it would already have been clearly sketched out within them by the more divine intellections. Guiding them to this truth is our God and Savior Jesus Christ, who reveals it to them as simple and clear and free of every ambiguity, symbolic complexity, and enigmatic obscurity. For just as pain, sorrow, and sighing flee from the life of practical virtue on account of perfect dispassion, so too also does all obscurity and ambiguity flee from the contemplation from the contemplative knowledge, from contemplative knowledge, on account of wisdom, for what will be given to them will be the naked truth, the adumbrations of which they have already received here on earth. For to everyone who has the desire quite clearly for things of the life to come, 
will certainly be added the enjoyment of these good things for all eternity. For our God is rich and he never ceases distributing the divine gifts of knowledge to those who love him. Gifts which in this present age, we are not able even to name on account of their sublimity and magnitude. If indeed what the great apostle says is true, namely that the ultimate blessedness is far above every name that is named not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. Alluding here to the highest summit of good things, which will appear after the distribution of every gift and after every ascent, and which cannot be uttered by any word or known by any mind. Things I say that are attainable by us in this age and of the things that will be revealed to us in the age to come and which we will perhaps name and know. For Jesus, the word of God, who has passed through the heavens and who is beyond all of the heavens, always raises up those who follow him in their practice and contemplation so that they are taken from inferior things to superior ones and again from these to what is still higher than these. And to put it simply, time would fail me to tell of the divine ascents and revelations of the saints in their transformation from glory to glory through the moment when each one of them receives the divinization that is most fitting to his proper order. Thank you, Anna. That's an immense passage. Immense. And let's begin to think just a little bit. So, Maximus talks about our natural longing and desire. So our movement unto God forms our personhood from our very beginning, from our genesis. But that movement is both given, but it is also made. It is also let be. It is created and yet our own, fully our own. This movement then is, um, it's movement as rather desire or longing, or to use the term which 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 I preferred because it's more widely applicable, applicable drawing near. So all movement is drawing near, here figured in terms of desire or longing, a drawing near into intimacy. That's the fundamental formative movement of life. And he plays with the idea of naming here. He says, perhaps we'll be able to name them. We can name them now. There are other things perhaps we will know and name later. Naming here is calling. And calling here is drawing near. So naming and calling unto and drawing near are... Um, are are in harmony here. Drawing near, as we've seen, is double movements, double movements, um, not only within the term itself, but here explicitly on this page, Maximus says, being moved, therefore, by this longing. So it's both our movement, but it's it's that which moves us too double movement so this is this is how synergy becomes a part of movement and so our 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 striving and since our striving is in form and time our aesthetic striving aesthetic is the aesthetic is all we know but our aesthetic striving is to make our drawing near the movement of our being synergetic our striving is to make or to let, make, let, give the double movement of our being, this moving and being moved. Our striving is to have that find its completion in God, not in time. Not in time and form. Our completion in time means our death, right? Our completion in God means our being unto life. 
And Max Smith also says something very, very curious here. He says that we we can begin to find our completion in God in this life as we respond to that divine call out of the simplicity and the eternity that we come to understand are, 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 are close to God. So this begins already. This is more about human labor, human activity. We can begin to find our completion. It depends on our response. All right. And now the last, uh, just to follow that thought a little bit. This is page 221 over to 223. Uh, halfway down page 221, and it's just over to the end of the ambiguum. But who would be able to enumerate all the aspects of God our Savior, which exist for our sake? Huh. All the aspects of God our Savior, which exist for our sake, and according to which he has made himself edible and participable, to all, edible and participable to all, in proportion to the measure of each. So to all, but in proportion. In proportion to what? The measure of each. Two lines down. Proper and profitable communion in these is attained by those who assimilate each member each member in light of the spiritual meaning signified by each. In this manner, according to that holy and great teacher, the Lamb of God is eaten and given up to spiritual digestion, assimilating to himself through the Spirit, assimilating those who partake of him. For he guides and transposes each one to the place in the body that corresponds that corresponds to the member that was spiritually eaten by him, so that in a way befitting, in a way befitting his love for mankind, the word who is in all things might take on substance, though he alone transcends nature and mind, or physin and logon. I don't know why they translate it as mind, but nature and logos. Okay. This is an astonishing passage. Immediately, the aspects of God or aspects of God exist for our sake. It's an amazing thing to say. This is a way of phrasing that God is unto. God is unto us. As it were, God is for our sake. Or we could say God is for our sake, insofar as God partakes of being, it is for our sake. We could say that. But God is unto us for the sake of our communion with him. God is unto us, and we are unto, we are unto, our being is a being unto. This is a mutual calling forth. This is, this is the double drawing near. And yet, because it is in synergy, it is simple. As one. It's what Maximus calls our twofold being as well. So that's, that's one idea. Another idea is that he says each and all, well, to use a liturgical phrase, each and all have their own appropriate form their own appropriate formation which means each and all each one of us and all of us have our own particular transformation underway transformation we have our own particular formation our appropriate formation fitting for us which means we have our own particular transformation underway this is the inner transform Trans uh, transformation that Maximus says is mystically proclaimed. This means 
that, or rather, this implies that each encounter means the presence of transformative movement. Each encounter is with transformation. Each encounter is with transformation or movement. Um, we call this transfiguration when it's complete. Each encounter means the presence of transformation or transformative movement. And so in form, in form, we seek not merely coherence, but a surpassing uh, the, the surpassing harmony of the transformation that's occurring. So not how the form fits together, how the integrity of another person fits together, but the harmony which arises from and surpasses out of their transformation. And this is what we mean by tonality. This is why tonality of a person or, or of, a, of a thing it is the most important question. We're listening to the, as it were, the melody of, 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 of transformation. And we also <clears throat> understand that Maximus says, Christ guides and transposes each one, each and all, to the place appropriate for them. So God transposes each, each one of us into deeper correspondence with him. God transposes each of us into deeper correspondence with, with his own, with the reality beyond uh, nature and mind. And it's this, it's the process or the ecstasis of correspondence that we see, that we meet in the person we encounter. Okay. Um, let's look at one more one more passage before we before we open it up. I was going to leave this, but I think it fits, and I think that it, it's a it's an okay time. And then and then we can we can feel free to 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 wander or stride or frolic anywhere we wish to in these fields of meaning, as David calls them. Ahmed, may I, uh, may I prevail upon you, my friend, to read a little bit, please? Um, so the section that, I, that, that, I, that we're, we'll listen to and then, and then just think about a little bit is actually the whole of Ambiguum 47. Uh, so it begins on page 207. It's just over to page 211, just, a, just a two pages thereabouts. Um, but let's listen to the whole thing with these ideas in mind, transposition and harmony and so on. Um, and, and then we'll think a little bit. Ahmed, please read from, from the Gregory passage right to the end. From St. Gregory's same oration on Pascha. We need not be surprised that first and foremost, a lamb is required in each and every house. And now Maxims. Someone perhaps might ask, and with good reason, as it seems to me, that if Christ, who through the law and the prophets and by the magnificence of creation is mystically proclaimed to those with spiritual ears and eyes, is one, how is it that the law, when ritually celebrating the type of Christ, commands that a multiplicity of lambs be slain in the houses of the families? To him we say that, if we wish to receive the word intelligibly, touching the ears and eyes of our souls and opening them, on the one hand, to the reception and contemplation of his mysteries, and on the other, to the avenging of every disobedience and the rejection of all futility, we can surely learn the hidden intention of Holy Scripture by joining the present passage to a similar one from the Holy Apostle, who says, 
I decided to know nothing in you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. For each of those who has believed in Christ according to his own power and according to the state and quality of virtue existing within him is crucified and crucifies Christ together with himself. That is, he is spiritually crucified together with Christ. For each person brings about his own crucifixion according to the mode of virtue that is appropriate to him. One person is crucified solely in the sense that he does not actively sin, having put sin to death by nailing it to the cross through the fear of God. Another is crucified with respect to the passions themselves and so heals the powers of the soul. Another is crucified with respect to the fantasies that arise from the passions, not leaving his senses free to admit any of the rising waves of their distractions. Another is crucified with respect to the sinful thoughts and memories that follow in their wake. Still another is crucified with respect to the deception that arises from sensation, while someone else is crucified through his rejection of the relation of natural intimacy between the senses and objects of sensation. Another, by means of the cross, quells every movement of sense perception in general, so that he possesses absolutely nothing within himself operating solely on the level of nature, while another completely ceases even from intellectual activity itself. And there is something greater than this, he who through dispassion is crucified by means of practical philosophy passes over to natural contemplation in the spirit, just as if he had passed over from a flesh of Christ to his soul. And he who is put to death by natural contemplation, having cast off the intellect's symbolic contemplation of beings, is transferred to the uniform, simple initiation into, into theological science just as if he had been raised up from a soul of Christ to the mind of Christ. But he who completely negates this initiation ascends beyond it to the ineffable, apophatic indeterminateness, just as if he had mystically ascended from a mind of Christ to his divinity. Each person then, as I have said, according to his own power and according to the grace of the Spirit, that is granted to him in respect of his worthiness, has Christ present in him and in proportion to him, leading him through increasing mortification to ever more sublime ascents. Thus it happens that each of us in his own rank, as if in a kind of house built on the level of virtue that is appropriate to him, sacrifices the divine lamb, partakes of its fleshes, and takes his fill of Jesus, for to each person, Christ Jesus becomes his own proper lamb to the extent that each is able to contain and consume him. He becomes something proper to Paul, the great preacher of the truth, and again, something distinctively proper to Peter, the leader of the apostles, and something distinctively proper for each of the saints, according to the measure of each one's faith and the grace granted to him by the Spirit, to one in this way and to another in that so that Christ is found to be wholly present throughout the whole of each, becoming all things to everyone. Thank you, my friend. What could be more beautiful than, than to one in this way and to another in that? How perfect is that? that, that that's lovely. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's think a little bit. This is immense, and this is the whole... The whole ambiguum. I want to think carefully, but 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 broadly. Um, he seems here to demonstrate, show, uh, set forth how drawing together becomes drawing near. How drawing together becomes drawing near. We also see here that Christ. Procla mystically proclaims, proclaims his gifts of openness or correspondence and measure. This is just on page 207. Openness and measure. If we receive, if we wish to receive the word, opening them 
on the one hand to the mystery and on the other hand to measure pardon me and measure here becomes drawing near unto his own drawing near unto god's own that's the only criteria we have if we are drawing near or not <laughs> we see here that bringing things together or unto completion is what gathering means bringing things together unto completion is what gathering means and so completion means a gathering unto a gathering unto maximus plays excuse me has has uh, refuses any final temporal measure here though he plays with is and just as if is and just as if using both as images of truth so is or ontology and just as if or aesthetics both are images of truth apart from time and then he moves he moves through the flesh the flesh of christ and that lovely passage about the different aspects that are with us the different aspects of ourselves that are crucified together with christ we draw together with christ which means we draw near to christ but the movement through the flesh through the soul and then mind and divinity of christ this is apophatic gathering it's not a denigrate progressive denigration of the person of christ uh, for something higher as it were it's a gathering unto completion it's the flesh and the soul and the mind and the divinity that is our image of completion He also, towards the end now, just on 2.11, he, he yeah, just to read the, the, the last, the last half dozen lines. And something distinctively proper for each of the saints, according to the measure of each one's faith, right? and the grace granted to him by the Spirit. So according to the the, the 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 path taken by the saint but the grace granted to to one in this way and to another in that so that christ is found to be wholly present throughout the whole of each wholly present throughout the whole the whole of each it's really astonishing becoming all things all things to everyone all things to everyone and then we talk about certainty and identification and definition haphazardly. Uh, so this, this joining of grace and method at the end, uh, they both are drawing near. It's just the two sides of drawing near. Our method is to draw near, and by grace we are drawn near. But then this phrase, according to the measure of each, each one's faith, According to the measure of each one's faith. We read about this. I think we don't believe it, but I think we should try to believe it. Because I think if we did believe it, we would, everyone would be, everything would be different. As St. Saint, uh, Saint Siloan says, everyone would be doing things differently. But this mystery that, 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 we're, that we're shown here, that our striving takes us into endless beauty endless beauty and each effort each effort is rewarded with greater gifts our spiritual striving takes us into endless beauty and every effort every effort every single effort is rewarded with greater gifts this to undergo this i i imagine must mean the gift of 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 holy synergy flourishing the 
this is what is meant by from glory to glory. And I think this is this is kind of this and this is the end. This is kind of what we mean by Christ in all and Christ as all and Christ fulfilling all and blessing all and gathering all unto his own. No matter how hard we strive, we are taken that 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 that, that striving is matched and, and outdone by a beauty of which we have no no for, for which we have no horizon. And yet we don't. We turn. It's very, very strange. Perhaps that's why Maximus spends all that time on things we need to crucify things we need to put to death, as it, so to speak. And by put to death, I think here he just means don't let them be determining any longer for our being. It doesn't mean to disdain something. Ah, but this, this, according to the measure of each one's faith, it amazes me completely amazes me so some thoughts some thoughts let's let's circle back uh, wherever we wish as we wish what comes forth what what provokes us here ahmed why don't you begin you just read out you have in your mind this last ambiguum here or elsewhere, uh, what uh, what pricked you? Just a prick. What's uh, what's going on? Well, I'm glad you landed on Ambiguum 47 because I thought reading that Ambiguum 47 was, to me, it was perhaps uh, the uh, most powerful Ambiguum so far that I've read in Maximus, and that's saying something. Um, because, I mean, you, you've said most of it already, Andrew, but there is a deep generosity. This is a man writing in the seventh century. There's a deep, deep generosity about the way he sees uh, Maximus, the way that Maximus sees the, the spiritual relationship with, with Christ. And who is it accessible to? And who is it open to? And in what way it's open to people? When I read uh, on page 209, before he starts going to uh, the list of another is crucified, another is crucified, another is crucified, that enumeration, early on page 209, when he says, uh, so, I'll start with, for each person brings about his own crucifixion according to the mode of virtue that is appropriate to him. So when I read that, I, I felt a certain, again, this, this almost invitation, an invitation to all to join in, in, in the, I'm going to use your word, in the, in the spiritual feast. For all to join. And I think even when I was thinking that, I was thinking, well, maybe that that line of reasoning would be open to, oh, well, is it just kind of a generic, benign pluralism? Everyone is. And then I thought, well, the focus is not on for each one. The focus is on crucifixion and and what that means. And I think you started to kind of break that down a little bit. Uh, I wish you had gone a little bit more into it. Uh, Go into it now. Go pursue the thought now however no, no, we feel you have gone into because i i can't crucifixion is i'll i'll be very uh simple here and 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 try to be try to be careful the idea that every every each person brings about his own crucifixion within that phrasing crucifixion in my uh uh, shallowly informed reading of it because I don't know your tradition as well. This idea of, for me, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it encompasses 
suffering, but also more um, an engagement with the deepest difficulties that a person encounters when they are in spiritual in the spiritual uh, battle and that's for everyone that's that's everyone that's everyone and which then brings me to the sentence before which is for each of those who has believed in christ according to his own power and this i'd like to maybe redirect it to you which is in this sense of course i imagine he means christ jesus christ but what does christ here when he says who has believed in christ according to his own power can christ encompass a greater um, register of meaning than than christ the the man the figure it seems to me here that to believe in Christ, Christ is something far more immense. And I say far more because my conception of Christ, of course, is uh, maybe a little bit limited. But maybe I'll stop here and maybe if anybody wants to. But let me follow up immediately just on that. And, and then, and then I, please, I'd like you to proceed. But that, that sentence you, you point to that you landed on, believe in Christ according to his own power, his own dynamis, it's 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 one of those phrases that when one pauses over it, it it's shattering nearly um two things to note and then and then i'll pass it to to you to david to, to anna to michael belief remember doesn't mean uh acquiescence to ideas or uh, uh swallowing something despite fact or evidence right it doesn't even mean agreement uh, in in this sense, especially in the sense of double movement and drawing near, but to be linked in the deepest sense of love and life to Christ, which is a fair rendering of of let's say a belief in in a sense. Well, then Christ is in all things and has become all things to all people. So. Being linked to the Christ who is all, being linked in love, in the deepest love and, 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 and vital relation, to the Christ who is everywhere present and fillest to all things, who has become all things to everyone, who is in the countenance of every person we meet um, and everyone we don't meet. That's that seems to me to be to be circling around a mode of ecstatic presence. To, to come back to, to a slightly more, let's say, a theological language, but but we don't have to go there. But but it's not really about mental ascent. It strikes me, uh, which only deepens the, the the great great mystery that you're pointing to, which is the idolatry of misrecognition, and or the assumption. I think. But but go on, go on. Uh, I think also maybe that very final, the very final half dozen lines in the ambiguum, which you, I think, uh, aptly uh, reread, this idea of uh, to one in this way and to one in another. Yes, Andrew, I, I the that has a deep resonance for me as well. Uh, and 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 then of course the corollary of that is becoming all things to everyone. I mean, those two together then open it it's just wide open, where it's just all are invited. All are invited. Um, Can I? Um, I really like how you guys are reading this, um, and it's. It's a lovely way of looking at that passage, but I would like to bring forth my struggle with it. Um, but I think it's the word mortification that comes on page 211. Um, 
leading him through increasing mortification to ever more. So, so the words mortification and crucifixion. I know that we as Christians are supposed to embrace the ascetic mode of being where we purify ourselves through crucifixion and mortification. However, it is for me, like, I don't, I don't think we can have, I don't think we can leap over that, or at least I can't. So I see it and I struggle um, with it. Anna, why do we need to leap over it? Oh, no, no. I'm just saying the conversation for me has a happy, so far has it's gone, has a happy ending, right? So the good news is Christ is found to be wholly present throughout the whole of each becoming all things to everyone. So that's great. So the, like we get to the good news. But there's a whole lot of crucifixion going on before that. You see what I'm saying? So, so I want you guys to help me with that. How are we, okay, so rather than just doing um, sort of a cliched understanding of self-mortification that most people associate with monasticism or, or especially, I guess, Western monasticism, I mean, he, he does preach that the path to Christ is crucifixion and mortification, so... You guys said something interesting to me, which I like, which is to, the turning away from that which confuses you into something that won't. But I mean, let's look at this. Like, so this is, again, I'm bringing out my struggles. So I hope you guys are okay with that. Um, another by means of the cross quells every movement of sense perception in general so that he possesses absolutely nothing within himself operating solely on the level of nature. And I just locate us, locate us. Oh, I'm sorry. 209. And it's uh, towards the beginning, maybe like 12 lines up. Towards, towards the end of 209. While another completely ceases even from intellectual activity itself. Anna, acor yeah. according, according to the mode of virtue that is appropriate to each. Yes. I agree. Yes. Yes. So, so what you could say to me to comfort me is you're clearly not in this house. You're clearly at the bottom steps. And, and I agree with you. I am. So, so I, and I would agree with Maximus. That is where I am. Do you see my problem? Does no one else struggle? I mean, it's great that none of you struggle with this because then there's hope for me. Don't ever assume silence means one thing. No, don't assume struggle or lack of struggle. What the, the, the word is a, is a harrowing one. It's a, it's a very harrowing and so is mortification. It's not better in Greek, it's, it's necrosis. Like it's, a, it's, a, it's almost a medical term. But it's a harrowing one because it is drawn forth from the facts of the biographical facts of life unto our own attempted drawing near to Christ. And and the word is it's it's a it's it's almost unbearable to think about physically. It's 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 awful. But it, I'm just I'm just scanning through. You read the two you just read out the two most rarefied moments of 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 crucifixion where these are these are people who are operating very very subtly but on page 209 much of what maximus walks through and crucifying it might be painful but in each one it seems to be crucifying an illness or a disease or something that has got in the way and so it's kind of like it's kind of like that the, the severity is is um it's not masochistic it's it's uh it's um 
It's meant to be vivifying. That's that's one of the only one of the ways that because the language troubles me too. I think one could maybe put it another way, but I think there is a reason. But uh, but uh, David, what do you make of this? Christ didn't crucify himself. He was crucified. Uh, mortification. I mean, because of the kind of what you're responding to, Anna, I, I really appreciate you raising this because it it sharpens what's, I think, going on here. Mortification isn't what people do to themselves. That's a sickness. Crucifixion isn't what people do to themselves. That's a sickness. But at the same time, because of our who we are as human beings, we experience we experience the deep uh, struggle and traumas of our our way of understanding things, and how mistaken it is, or how death dealing it is. Crucifixion and mortification, I think, are descriptive terms of existential moments in, li in the life of people. Moments, and what he's saying is pay attention to it. Contemplate it. Remember it. Stand at the foot of it. Don't run away from it. Something's going on. Something's unfolding. But it only unfolds through it. It doesn't unfold by skirting it. Or by pretending otherwise. Does that help? Oh, it, you know, and I just, I saw suddenly the formulation. Because he doesn't say crucifies himself. He said is crucified. Yeah. So that puts a different, you're absolutely right. That puts a whole different, another is crucified with respect to the passions themselves. Because you are, you will be, that's just life. That's right. You have to be, yeah. And then the question is, do you pretend it doesn't happen? Okay. Or do you, uh, do you run away? like the disciples did? Do you behave like Peter? Warm yourself by the fire and say, I never knew that. I don't know that in my life. That's not who I am. It's heartbreaking. That's why it's so it's so terrible, it seems to me, that we that that there's this kind of tradition developed <laughs> which speaks about crucifying the flesh and crucifying the passions and all that sort of stuff. Well, lots of luck. But I know in Russian, I may have mentioned this before, but there's a little a little woman's monastery not far from Edmonton, an hour and a half away or something like that. This is the only place I've seen it, but I understand it's quite common in Russia. But you probably know this, Emma. But there was, there was a, a kind of a famous uh, priest who wandered around here on horse and buggy and dog sled. And he died out there. And uh, so on his gravestone, it says, I can't remember it accurately, but um, uh, Father Yosef nailed down on the 13th of March, 1906. So I understand this is a common expression for mm -hmm. Russians that all death is a crucifixion. And it's not exactly wanted in most cases. <laughs> it's what occurs. Thank you for this. 
um, because I'd also been thinking about this idea of guilt in the church. And I was a little worried when I was thinking about it. Yeah. Um, the marketing of guilt. Well, church. my thought was we, the church does not ask us to feel guilty. Uh, this is kind of, I, I, I realize I'm, I'm out on a limb. So I'm just walking out on that one. Except insofar as it asks, as it gets us to repent. Rather, it points out that we already do feel guilty. I think as human beings, we are perpetually feeling indebted. We're guilty. Some of us cover it over better than others. But I wonder then that this is the same thing. So turn towards that guilt that you are feeling, mm -hmm. right? And accept it as the path towards, rather than being told you must feel. Does that make sense? Am I, and now I'm really out on the limb and I'm gonna stop talking in a minute, but. It, I I noticed uh, I know I've noticed at times when um, at the great uh, the service on Great and Holy Friday, where there is the contemplation of the crucifixion, and the dead God is carried around the church or around the town, around the cosmos, and laid in the tomb. When I've when I've been present at that service out in a little Romanian town, a couple hours from here, where the people are all peasants. I mean, they may be, they're wealthy because they've been very successful farmers, but they're peasants. And I use the term deliberately here because I get a different feeling at my own church here. But of course, it's none of my business to presume about other people's feelings. But I was so, the first time I saw it, I was so taken aback because the people gathered around and sobbed. And it was so obvious to me that all of their passions, all of their suffering was there in this suffering. And so it was an icon of their reality. And this was the time when their little story danced with this extraordinary story, which is not extraordinary at all. It's a simple story. It's their story. So I, and I agree with you entirely. Any, anybody that wants to make you feel guilty for something. I mean, I've often thought of the power of positive guilt. I would like to use it more often, but again, this is, I think you put it well. We know it. It arises in us. We feel it. And the church, I mean, the whole spiritual discipline of confession and what have you is one of one of accepting the crucifixion, descending for three days, and resurrecting, saying, enough now. Set it behind you. It isn't the point. Yeah. Let me, I think, just think along with you a little bit, David and Anna. Crucifixion is undergone, and the model of our crucifixion, as you just phrased well, David, is the overcoming of, of mortality and, and, and death and time, basically. Guilt strikes me as a response to, to, 
to st guilt strike me as, as being defined by time, not in a good way. It, it strikes me as a response to perceived incoherence of our being in time past. We wanted to be a certain way. We weren't. We are now this way. It's, 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 it's defined by time and it allows something which is unreachable in time to be the present, which is odd too, it's odd. There's no ecstasy to guilt. Um, there's removal of presence, but not ecstasy. And it strikes me that guilt too, in, in trying and in, in, in yearning for a coherence of being that wasn't there, misses the mark further in thinking that it's it's coherence of being that we seek identity sameness that we seek rather than striving integrity the melody of our of our being together with others now so that move into guilt is a very strong i, I wouldn't agree with you that everyone feels guilt i think that that's i think that that's that that's an affliction that many many people do but it's not natural and it's not given it's not a gift at all and even the discipline of confession david alludes to confession is not a wiping clear of the past it's a renewal of the present a renewal of the future really our openness to the future it's not time bound in that way either So that, that's a thought. That's a thought we can, we can, we can. But if we take away the constraint of time, then confession is liberation from what you, so I think, I think you're absolutely right. The guilt is, is demonic really, you know, in a way. And mm. that confession isn't the wiping clean of the past. I think you're absolutely right about that too. But it is a liberation in the present from the chains that we have forged. From time, yeah. In time. Liberation from time. Yes. Yeah. 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 And it hangs on us now. You see what I'm saying? Like, I think you're absolutely right. We're, we're living in the past through guilt which is to come to bring it back to this season, the opposite of the temporal marker in every Lenten service, which is today, today. as David just yeah, said, right. today, right. this is right. our, it's not in the past, it's not someone else, today. It's like this that. present holy encounter. Yeah, no, it's really beautiful, Anna and David, that was really beautiful. No, thank you, Andrew, I, I appreciate that. I really like that. I like the temporal way you defined it. Can I let, let me let me see if we can take a a, a a turn here, but but it may I hope I hope it's not too strange a way in. Um, to be, I want to talk about creativity, and I'm, I'm looking at you in particular, and thinking of Berdyaev, and thinking about the ages, and thinking about the Trinity, and thinking about divine uh, <laughs> fair gear and all that. So that's all in the background, but my walking into it is a little bit strange, maybe. Guilt is guilt is is a is a way of dwelling with time that forecloses us to encounter and to the divine. It, it's it's a temporal mode of dwelling which forecloses us. Now, in this in these passages, many several a handful today, Maximus talks about our other work in time, which prepares us as it were or opens us to to the to it to the eternal let's uh, let's find it actually um i i don't actually remember where it is so uh hmm. 
Yeah. Okay, I'll find it in a moment. Well, we begin on page 199 with the idea of artifice, with the idea of artifice. And then in the next ambiguum, uh, it's not there. Where is it? Oh, yeah, mainly it's an ambiguum 48 on page 213 over to 215 and, and so on. So contrasting guilt, which forecloses, with this activity, which is not simple, it is it is uh, um, composed. It is it is relational. There are different parts to it, um, and it is in time. So it's it's form and time. But this this is this is why we said earlier our response to how God calls out of eternity and simplicity. This is our, the the basis of our response creativity. So look at the bottom of. Uh, uh, Seven, eight lines up from the bottom of 213, page 213, please. We are urged on to our goal, striving all the more, striving all the more. That's a prayer every day, striving all the more because of these things, to attain that for the sake of which we have received this longing. Having secretly come to learn this, i.e. the source and object of our desire, of our belonging, of our personhood, of our drawing near, having secretly, it's a curious word, secretly come to learn this, those who are studious and zealous lovers of truth set themselves, set before themselves one sole task and activity, namely, arduous labor, arduous labor arduous and labor in the service of this desire for from the actual observation and orderly sequence of things itself they have correctly realized that correctly realized that if in this present age they should through sacred through sacred visions sketch out to a certain extent the image of the truth of the age to come sketch out to a certain extent that's human making right there sketch out to a certain extent the image of the truth of the age to come and satisfy their longing for it and satisfy their longing for it. They would thereby prepare their souls and make them more eager still. Remember from glory to glory, there's nothing, there's no height that we can ever strive for that won't be far outmatched by what we, what we're given there. So that after this life, they would pass over effort, effort, effortlessly, effortlessly. They'll pass over effortlessly. This is life in life. This is divinity and this is synergy right here. Communion. Pass over effort effortlessly to the truth of the life to come. Since it would already have been clearly sketched out within them by the more divine intellections. All right, just that. So there is formative work. There is formative work in time. There is aesthetic work that we can do in our mortal lives, which will prepare us, does prepare us, is preparing us. This along with, I mean, a, a number of other things, but the um, the idea of crucifixion or the, or the, re, the repulsive aspect of crucifixion too, point to the, to the again, to the apophatic sense of, of, of our tradition. We don't damn anything. We, 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 we build from what we're given unto the, the genesis of that gift. But this idea of creativity, I wanted to open it up because here Maximus really opens up to human industry. He celebrated it before, but he hasn't really given it as something for us to think about until now. So if, if, we, if, we, if we wish, Anna, Michael, Ahmed, what do we make of, of Maximus's focus a few times on, on creativity, on making, on our activity in time? 
It seems to hark, harken back to the, the primal model of agency that Adam is that is attributed to Adam in that earlier um, ambiguum ambiguum yeah. forty five at the very very bottom of hmm. page one hundred ninety nine in the first paragraph referring to another contemplation of the same difficulty in which in the very last um, line, Adam is represented as being able to um, actualize his own movements in order to be voluntarily manifested. So that, that's one, that's a, an elusive form of um, agency, you know, a simple form of agency, which um, contrasts with our kind of, I mean, we often think of agency. I, I think that we lean too much on this notion, e even though it's um, you know, indispensable for a notion of rash, um, moral agency, namely the rational aspect. The contrast, you know, it would be the agency of animals that have, a, I think, should be regarded as. It seems so obvious to me they, they're capable of thought and agency, various animals but it's there's a simplicity and it's not um in the question of um guilt and moral agency that that can prompt um guilt as as you know it's a two-sided thing is um a two-sided um well it's a, it's a it's a form of agency that comes with a problem once we're um beyond any simple form of agency so this is kind of harkening back, but I have to say that I, I, I mean, the, the whole um, discussion of crucifixion also presents a kind of terrifying backdrop, um, which I, I, I think is the, is the specter that um, really uh, I'm not stating this too strongly. Terrified um, Nietzsche in contemplating um, the death of metaphysics, the death of the kind of source of beauty and creativity that once was effortlessly available and, and then had suddenly seemingly become for Nietzsche and various you know, Russian writers who were similarly prescient had become um, intensely problematic. And I, and when we think of crucifixion, I mean, it's right as David said, um, that the closest disciples um, defected in their moments of trial um, shortly after Jesus' arrest, you know, if only momentarily. And, um, but Jesus himself on the cross, um, as this, this is a most existentially horrifying sentiment for any Christian, um, also is thrown into a moment of despair. Now, this might be a, a naive interpretation, perhaps, you know, those of you who are steeped in um, hermeneutics of, of Jesus when he declares, you know, asks why he's being forsaken, can handle this easily, but I'm not, I'm not sure if we should handle it, that, that would seem to pluck out something, the very meaning of um, what it meant to um, represent all of this sin and um, in that moment, uh, you know, of course, it wouldn't be a sacrifice if it wasn't that singularly um, intense. But anyway, so I, I, I'm just kind of um, um, this is just kind of cathartic sharing of a, a kind of anxiety that, um, you know, probably does. I mean, as David says, crucifixion is something that happens to us. It's a form of suffering. And all of us at times, I think we're spiritually alive, um, have bleak moments, which <laughs> something even worse than than guilt, perhaps. But it's part of being free.
I read something interesting on the my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I don't remember where I read it. This is probably pretty dangerous to not remember, but um, it was Protestant, I think, that said, in those days, to say the first words of a psalm were to pray the whole psalm. Um, something like that. Like, if you didn't have time, you could just say the first words, and that was like saying the whole thing. And it occurred to me it was what David, it just links so beautifully back to what David was saying, that he's on the cross, he's already teaching us what to do when we are there with him. Does that make sense? So yeah. you will be crucified also. And what will you then do? <laughs> what will you pray? Does that make sense? I mean, I'm not taking away from the existential yeah. horror of it at all. No, no. I, I think I think that's very salutary, actually, because um, I mean, it's something. I mean, just that I, I understood exactly where you're going when you said that it's a, you're just saying the first words of a psalm. Is there a particular psalm that was? Yeah, it's a quote from the psalm. It's that a quote Jesus from the, was. It's um, David. My God, my God, why is thou? Why is for now? For say yeah, so so that was you know that that's really really helpful. I don't helpful. know which number number. What it's number? um yeah no I I, 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 I I'm think, sorry that I, I think interrupted that's rather rather important because otherwise yeah I mean it, otherwise it's um it kind of it's an isolated sentiment which <clears throat> you know, is almost um incoherent in light of the um, resurrection and, and the transfiguration beforehand. I mean, you can't, which, which isn't to, you know, I, I, I take it you're not, you know, dis dismissing the weight because of course, what, what is the Orthodox teaching? I, I mean, I assume this is canonical that Jesus is represented as encompassing um, all of our sin, even though he's sinless. But at that moment, is that a standard? Well, you know, as a, so many of the, the ancients said that if something isn't assumed by Christ, it's not sanctified. And that means this desperate moment. That means holy doubt my god my god why hast thou forsaken me that is a human experience <laughs> it's a profound human experience and you link it to the gethsemane you know in gethsemane where i mean we're seeing this struggle here and that struggle is an icon of the human struggle and I, it's a revelation. It may be a teaching too, but it's it reveals to us the gravity That's of a the better human word. Struggle. That's a better and word. How, and yeah. how profound that is. That's a better word. And you know, in the in the Lutheran Church of my childhood, on on Great and Holy Friday, in the Norwegian Pietist Church, they there was a custom of since the pietists hated the clergy, there was a custom of having laymen preach on what, what was called the seven last words from the cross. And it's the only memory I have of hearing my father preach. And it was on that word, the sixth word from the cross. It really had, and I don't know how old I was, I, I, I probably was. 10 maybe or 11 but i mean it just went down to the bottom of my heart 
And part of it is that um, I think for me, and I have just sort of kind of composite memory, I'm sure, but I, I knew that my father knew that. He'd experienced that maybe, maybe more than once. And to, to see that as holy, I, I mean, I, 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 I really even am ashamed to even say it that way, but to, in, in the abstract, to understand that God says that. God says that. There's a way you can flip this around, you know. And you, say, you can say that God is crucified every day and is saying to us human beings, my, my, my Adam, my Eva, why hast thou forsaken me? And then, of course, within the, within the Lutheran tradition, there was a habit to rush to the last word. Into thy hands I commend my spirit. In order to take away the pain of the sixth word. But in my memory, my father never took that away. I mean, they sit there together along with the other words of the cross the gesture to John, the word to Longinus. And of course, it's, it's just an echo, isn't it, of, of his conversation with the thieves. The thief that is bitter and is dying and can't recognize it because he's still acting out of his, out of the appetite of his own unbelievable preoccupation with how life is supposed to be. And then the other thief who knows he's dying. Says, I don't know why you're here, but I know why I'm here. And those words, which are the central words of the Eucharist, huh? remember me. Well, that remembering includes, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I don't know. I sometimes think they're the holiest words in scripture. They're certainly the hardest. I mean, it's I, nothing could be a greater testament to the um, relinquishing of power. I, I think you know now we're we're meant to. I guess that's all we have left. If if the good is something that dissolves, which you know seems to be, um, I don't know, inevitable from a to the running modern thought into a kind of reductio to the absurd absurd it's it amounts to a kind of dissolution of um, all all values complete relativity in other words and and all that's left at that point is just power and yeah but the i mean it i'm struggling a little bit with this but because it, it's a too simple just to described this as a kind of it's not so much a faithlessness as a kind of um, um despair absolute categorical relinquishing of um, any sense of power because faith faith can be empowering and so even even the power that some residual faith provides sorry i missed i missed that um Ahmed. could you could you repeat that no i thought you were i thought the word despair came to mind when you were kind of 
the, the, the word what? Despair. Oh, despair. Yeah, yes. Well, well, what what is despair but um, a sense of one's powerlessness in the face of <laughs> desire? But if it turns out that even desire has no basis in the, the good, I mean, then power in a sense that both, you know, it only emerges as something that, you know, intensifies our torment. And and so that 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 would be despair. And um for the source of goodness to create this disjunction between power and the good is just um, that is Christianity, I, I think, in a, a sense, and in the, the most potent critique of any attempt to give a kind of um, compatibilist or accommodating view of how we can get along without metaphysics. I think that's why Nietzsche was um, so. It, so repetitive in his different attempts to say something that would and so insistent that we're not really appreciating the, the nature of the problem if we uh, dissolve if the good is dead or god is dead or metaphysics yeah um i think andrew would ask us to think apophatically right about so my God, my God is both despair and the simultaneous transcending. And you can't separate them. They're, they're together. It is, it is both the despair and the transcending of that despair without resolving that tension, right? It's the two things at once. <laughs> held together so redemption as andrew would say in time redeeming the time but also staying in the time and we want to step on one side or other of that right we want to say either that god is dead and god has been for you know christ has been forsaken or that He's transcended that and he's gone now and it's great. We don't want that antimony to be held together. Yeah, yeah. we want certainty. We want certainty. Yeah. That's beautifully put on it. No, go on. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I was just thinking I'm I'm mm -hmm. I'm sort of riffing on something that you keep reminding us of that we always want to resolve things into a sim like a to categorize it and then put it away in a way. We don't want to hold the tension. Identification. Yeah. 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 And how how um you know I was gonna say intellectually grotesque, maybe I should say spiritually grotesque it would be to take the resurrection which lies on the other side of this despair and simply and say that it's something that is containable or that we understand it's obviously itself a kind of an infinitude not simply a, a simply a beyond that we leap to and find ourselves in a i mean that that the resurrection is perhaps the biggest stumbling block for anyone who's not a christian and <laughs> and yet it should be a it should be a kind of um ongoing not stumbling block but something that's always um beyond otherwise it's rather an impoverished um concept and presumptuous to think we know what it it means even that's an ap apophatic um, characterization it strikes me too just briefly i, I want to open it up to others but but just following Michael and, and 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 Anna, and what David said just just a moment ago. Right, Michael, we don't proceed from from the agony to the resurrection, and and then and then to, to refer back to 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 what Anna said, as if that tidies everything up, like there's no more life to the that that's that's why the apophatic thinking, the thinking through but not rejecting, is and because. If the death of Christ was rendered, um, let's say, moot, no, no, I have to be careful here. Um, 
Hey, Dita. Each, each hey. aspect, each aspect of God is for our sake, right? We read that in Maximus. Each aspect of God is for our sake. So the death of God and the resurrection of God are for our sake, both, both. And as David just said, that moment, that harrowing moment, which is unphrasable, has to be blessed too, because it's part of our own. And our own is Christ's own. When we think either, if, if there's a fixation on the crucifixion, that's stopping time, that, that, that's, that's allowing time, a moment in time to define things. Or if we bypass it and go, yeah, but a day later it was okay again. That's also allowing time to define things. The existential mystery or the mystical proclamation, as Maxima says, of each event, as David beautifully reminds us, is, 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 is meaningful. Yeah. Holy Week is lived every year. The death of God is lived every day. Indeed. And it's, uh, you know, sometimes when I, at the Pascha service, when people well, this is the Norwegian <laughs> when people are joyful, you know, and they say, Christ is risen, Christ is risen. It's, um, yeah, it's odd how that sits in me. I mean, I, I, I can say yes to it, but, you know, I, I have a pretty strong sense that um, there's more to come. It's also interesting to me that in the in the Eastern in the Orthodox Church, we move from this, we go to the cemetery between resurrection and ass an assumption or an uh, ascension. I don't know if all Orthodox folks do it, but the Slavs do. We go to the cemeteries and we bless the graves. We name everybody. And we pray a prayer of hope. May David come to a verdant field, a place of peace. So that, of course, is a prayer for us. It's about our remembrance. May our remembrance of the deceased that lies there may our memory of that person come through mortification, through crucifixion, may it come to be resurrected in us. May we come to the grace of seeing that person's life and our relationship to them in a way that no longer deals death, but in which we glimpse a little grace. May it, may our relationship to that person be healed from the eternal. And it happens, you know. Terrible. I know I told you some time back about the woman in our church who had a horrible husband who abused her all the time. And after going to that service for 13 years, having the priest come to the cemetery for 13 years and spitting on his grave after they did the, the little remembrance, the flood of tears came and she finally saw where she was in it all. It takes time, so. So we don't, I mean, we have this narrative and this intense cycle of services 
But of course, that's the liturgy itself. Every Sunday, every time it's done, that's what's done. <clears throat> And we are invited to enter into communion with it. And that also means into communion with, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I'm not gonna stop talking. I might wanna become a Christian here if I keep on like this. Yeah. Well, thank you, Anna and Michael. Ahmed. No, it's um, it really helps. I know Michael said that, but it really helps to think because there are thorns along the path, and they bother you. Yeah. As you go, and then. And you realize it's good to see that you've been looking at it the wrong way. I don't know if you've uh, countered this, Michael, about Nietzsche living in an eternal Good Friday. Uh, oh, no, I haven't. Um, tell me about that. Well, no, just um, I had read, I forget who I read about this, maybe Loweth, Carl Loweth. I can't remember who wrote it. But anyway, it said Nietzsche is stuck in an eternal Good Friday. Which is true. That's, that's a nice um, phrase. Like he never got to, never got to resurrection. Especially at this time of year. Because, I mean, God is dead is, in fact, you know. It's just he never could. And it was funny, too. He had this, this wild love-hate relationship with Christ where on the one hand he hated christians right and just despised them and for all sorts of reasons but he couldn't get christ out of his head that he you know for a time he thought of him as the ultimate superman right dying for others is sort of the you know what a superman would do beyond good and evil and then yeah so it he despised Christianity all his life, I think. I don't think he ever, but he he couldn't get Christ out of his head. Just on that note, Anna, and to, to, to just before you respond, Michael, it Michael, your comment earlier, I forget if you framed it along with Nietzsche or not, but but it brought him to mind about the good, to speak philosophically, the good being completely devoid of power, relinquishing all power. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Nietzsche's got the line the, of, uh, what's he called? Uh, the uh, Roman Caesar with Christ's soul. That's yeah. one of his, that's one of his versions of the, and, and we know that, you know, we've talked about this, Michael, but others know too. Sonnet, I think 52 of Shakespeare, those that have power to her and would do none. Can you do you know it? Have you memorized yeah. it, Michael? Can you yeah, recite, I, um, recite it for us? Okay, let's work through it because because this idea of I'll, I'll, I'll just of, do it kind of um, quickly and trippingly, so I, I'll actually maybe remember it. But those who have power and will do none, who do not do the thing they most do, show who moving others are themselves as stone and move it cold and who temptation slow. They rightly do inherit heaven's graces and husband nature's riches from expense. They are the lords and masters of their faces, others but stewards of their excellence. And then the last part, the summer's flower is to the summer sweet, though to itself it only live and die. But if that flower with base infection meets, the basest weed outbraves its dignity for sweetest things turn sourest by their deeds. Lilies that fester smell far worse than weeds. Yeah, it strikes a nice balance. I mean, um, you know, um, Shakespeare's both admiring, you know, a Caesar, but tempering it um, and saying that precisely a Caesar is someone that, uh, outstandingly virtuous, the megalopsukos is precisely the person who, if 
things go awry is formidably more horrible as a I, I wouldn't put Putin in the Megalopsukos camp, but perhaps in some by some lights he he has achieved an astounding result for Russia, but he, he's also created a kleptocracy. So even if he hadn't, you know, invaded Ukraine. Um, I think of any outstandingly virtuous person other than our savior, and and I think the the per, you can quickly imagine the person using their resourcefulness in a another way. It's precisely, I suppose, that's the idea of a saint. There's a kind of renunciation of power and a kind of cleansing of the temptation that is always there for a a great person, a hugely resourceful person, let's say. This we don't want to we don't want to step sideways too much. So pardon me if this is this radical disjunction of holiness and power, which I wouldn't know, uh, and 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 musing won't get one far. But it seems to be a particular, perhaps peculiar, uh, notion of divinity. Uh, I don't know if it's unique, but but uh, but but the the overall rendition is unique. The separation of, of holiness or divinity from power. The connection of holiness or divinity with finitude, with incarnation, with us. Um, this radical reorientation of what relationship means between or within perceived hierarchy or even just establish blessed hierarchy, however we want to figure it. How the transfiguration, transformation of relation alters our whole sense of being unto. It seems to me that, that this is a of a of a of a of a piece. And it's the it's the way that Power doesn't remain the last thing standing when we're desperate. Because um, it was set down. Yeah. It was set down. And 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 and, and that's it. You know, of course, the, the, the logos becoming um, finite and, and, and kind of breaking into, into the world and in and, and all of us is also power is, can be permeated by goodness. And, and I think that's, of course, what Shakespeare is hinting at. Power can be redeemed, but it's not the power per se. It's a manifestation of something that is beyond... Um, conceptualizing his power. So this gets back to your point about creativity. Um, you know, a glorious form of creativity is obviously uh, something that's empowering. And that, you know, it's a beautiful manifestation. So it's, um, I, I'm saying something that's so obvious just so that there's not a clean disjunction getting back to Anna's point. You know, we can't um, think of these things, these important concepts um, in isolation or you know, just discreetly. So obviously power in an isolated way is problematic or if, in a, if it's allowed to permeate rather than be permeated by the logos, that's, I guess that's sort of the, what Shakespeare's sonnet is kind of hinting at. This is also, Micah, you bring up a nice way into a, a fanciful thought that, that Berdeyev has and that, I, that I, I was hoping to throw Anna's way in, David's way in, Ahmed's way, about, about ages. And he's playing, he's playing a bit. But he said, you know, he says, the first age is, is the age of God the Father, as it were. 
And the second age, which we're in now, is the age of the incarnation, that God the Son, as it were. And the third age, which we are welcoming or inaugurating, I'm not sure how he would phrase it, is the age of the Holy Spirit, as it were. And this age is the age in which our incarnation, which was, uh, which was taught and then revealed and manifested, now will flourish, as it were, from, from as it were from our side of the synergy. And so theurgy, the, theurgy right? Theurgy. And yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Creativity then becomes a main way in which we we uh, making or letting, to refer to language, drawing near, right? This was set up throughout, becomes becomes our emphasis. Our emphasis is our own drawing near. Well, when our making, when our aesthetic activity is deformed into power, which may be a common temptation, pro probably is a common temptation, that is responded to or answered by this teaching, which Michael, you indicate, Annie and David, you beautifully reveal that God, our God, has nothing to do with it. God is not a revelation of power. It's a revelation of, of something else. And so, I mean, even on these kind of fanciful terms, one could see how this meditation on power could ease our way into thinking of human creativity in a way which would not make us little tyrants ourselves if we wanted to dance with Berdyaev a little bit. But uh, mm. he uh, actually, Berdyaev on the question of power, he really struck me. I mean, I struggle with him as Andrew knows, but um, he said, God comes like a thief in the night, right? So it was precisely this idea that God does not reign in the way that earthly rulers reign. He does not manifest his power in that way, right? The kingdom of God comes like a thief in the night is that, and the reason for that, as you say, Andrew, I think for Berdyaev, is that insofar as he is our Lord, it is because we call him that not because he forces himself upon us, right? So um, when we call him Lord, it is a voluntary thing that we are doing and only then will he sit on the throne of our parts right but he will not come that he won't break in and so I, I i i've been really struck by that idea of sovereignty right where i mean obviously god is all powerful but in relation to us he is he relinquishes that power so that we may come to him voluntarily but on a separate point um about creativity so the use of the word theurgy, I think, refers to magic, right? So it's a tricky word, theurgy, because I, think, I, I read something on uh, Dionysus the Europagite, and he, people struggled with him because the, theurgic activity was magical activity. But I love the the way that... Sorry, Anna, do you mean, do you mean understood as... Magical activity in the ancient prior to... world, yeah. But what was interesting about Berdyaev, and, and, and this is my last point, and I'll stop talking. What was interesting to me about what Berdyaev said is that actually magic and modern technology come from the same source, which is the desire to control the material world and to single-handedly, humanly correct the fall right so that magic and technology really are one and he got this from dostoevsky by the way andrew i think you'll recognize that and so that's the grand inquisitor right miracle mystery and authority 
in the modern world is is done through technology. So that's I so and anyway, as the Berdyaev Eye expert, I would say that yes, in fact, what Andrew said is exactly what Berdyaev Eye was playing around with. The idea that the desire for power that manifests itself in technology and magic is precisely the approach to the world that we should not have, right? Um, to try to control and rectify the fall by means of our own. <clears throat> it's antichrist. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's so odd how the Christian tradition where Christian communities have paid so much attention to, as Whitehead calls it, giving God metaphysical compliments, that there's all kinds of mischief that takes place. So when you think of God as omnipresent, as omnipotent, uh, all of that sort of thing, omniscient, and if that's kind of the ground upon which you then try to construct a theological cathedral, you end up in such an awful place and it's but it's so ubiquitous i mean such good people that i know are constantly talking about god as being in control or that god is somehow or other it's all part of god's plan god isn't a planner even aquinas knew that Jacques Maritain, you know, Ivan Illich had this conversation with Jacques Maritain because Ivan Illich was for a little while on the school board in Puerto Rico and they were all talking about planning and Illich didn't know where this word came from. What is this word planning, planning? I must go and talk to Jacques. <laughs> so he went to Princeton and he talked to Jacques Maritain and they sat there and Illich said, so Jacques, what is planning? <laughs> what does planning mean? And Maritain said, I, uh, Aquinas never uses the word planning. <laughs> I just got such a kick out of his description of this conversation. So finally they ended up, Jacques gets a bright brightness in his eyes and he said, ah, planning. It is a form of hubris that banishes surprise. So, David, I remember the exact, that's from, uh, that's in David Cayley's program. I remember the exact quote, it's, Mais mon cher, je comprends, c'est un nouveau espèce de présomption. It's uh -huh. a new form of presumptuousness. Yeah. 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 Well, Everyone, so this has been utterly delightful, but I must head out. You can see I'm smiling. It's just brought so much joy, this experience. This is a good time for us to take our leave. No, it's Thank good. you all. Thank you. See you.